Center for Night. Kevin, back to you. Thank you, Linda. Tonight, a case that may change the way you think about justice in Oklahoma. A heinous murder from three decades ago, and the question, is our state punishing the wrong man? News Channel 4's Allie Meyer has been investigating this for some time. She joins us live at the scene of the crime. Allie. Well, Edmund, we're, well, Kevin, we're in Edmond right next to Shakey's. This store behind me is a paint store now, but it used to be Edmond Liquor Store. An Oklahoma woman lost her life on the floor of the liquor store here. And a man from Louisiana, a man who claims he never set foot in this building, also says his life changed here forever. No one wants to think they're innocent men in prison because if the system won't protect the innocent, we are all at risk. Tonight, the possibility a well-intentioned court sent a guiltless man to death row. We want to take you back 30 years, 1974, when Edmond was still a tiny bedroom community. And on the night before New Year's Eve, a killing that rocked the town. This is filmed from deep in our archives. The Edmund Liquor Store used to stand near 7th and Broadway. December 30th, 1974, two black men murder a white woman and wound another in the process of raiding the register. It was a big deal in Edmund because Edmund had only recently begun to have any homicides. Retired detective Gary Carson worked the case for Edmund PD. I had helped process the crime scene myself and there was little if any usable evidence came from the crime scene. No murder weapon, no usable fingerprints, no solid leads, except one, an eyewitness account. That night, there were three witnesses in the liquor store, a clerk who was shot to death, a customer who walked in on the robbery and who was also shot, and a third, the worker behind the counter, who would later testify all she saw was the business end of a 22 revolver. It was the wounded customer who would prove most valuable. 18-year-old Belinda Brown was buying liquor with a fake ID when she took a bullet in the head. I think really she was in a state of shock and really just glad to be alive. Police called in artist Jim Gar to formulate composite sketches. You know, it was difficult to, to get details from her, but uh, I think we got enough that we were finally able to come up with a with a composite sketch. According to case documents from 1975, Belinda Brown positively identified at least three different suspects in a series of lineups. 21-year-old Glenn Simmons was never picked, but a month after the murder, he and another man were charged with the crime. The Edmund murder trial would last three days. Presiding, Judge Joe Cannon and his characteristic no-nonsense brand of justice. Judge Cannon ruled both suspects would be tried together. Jim Anderson watched the trial from the jury box. He remembers, despite the lack of physical evidence, every juror believed the state's prime witness, Belinda Brown. The witness carried it because she was so positive, and the defense attorney did not shake her one bit. And I remember that. Over the years, I've learned that sometimes the eyewitnesses are not always right. But it's what the jurors didn't hear that may have affected the verdict. Trial transcripts show Simmons' attorney never introduced Jim Gar's composite sketch, a drawing of a man much larger than Simmons. He never questioned Belinda on the three other men she picked out, never said a word about why she changed the prescription in her glasses right after the lineups. I do remember, it seemed like the defense attorney wasn't... I mean, he, he wasn't real slick, put it that way. After trial, Simmons' lawyer, Henry Floyd, was disbarred, citing more than 20 courtroom complaints. But the damage was already done. The jury sentenced Simmons and the other suspect to death. You know, I mean, I went to death row on this one person saying he did it. And for 28 years, Glenn Simmons has been locked up and in an Oklahoma prison. Coming up after the break, a move to get him out. Next, the man who put Glenn Simmons behind bars, now having second thought. We continue now with our special report, The Wrong Man. In the summer of 1975, Glenn Simmons and another man were sentenced to death for a murder at an Edmund liquor store. We pick up the story with Simmons himself, a man who's been behind bars for 28 years for a crime he swears he didn't commit. Glenn Simmons has spent the majority of his life in a state-issued jumpsuit. He'd have been executed if state law hadn't changed his sentence to life back in 78. 
I read, I heard somewhere, somebody told me, say, you could uh, always get out of the prison, but you can't ever get out of the grave, you know. And so, you know, every day above ground is a good day. Simmons grew up in Harvey, Louisiana, right outside New Orleans. He says that's where he was the night of the liquor store murder. Police records show his story hasn't changed in 28 years. We know for a fact that Glenn was not in Oklahoma at that time. Robert Antoine remembers playing pool with Glenn that night, then football here on New Year's Day. Antoine is one of several witnesses who testified in Simmons' trial. What they always say, a little saying, kangaroo coat, you know, when two black guys killed a white girl and all white jury. That's what was going through our mind. I could tell him what he had on. Irma Truss was also there, though you might expect a mother to side with her son. She told the court Glenn didn't leave Louisiana until a week after the murder. I could tell him he had on some beige pants and a brown velvet jacket on a New Year's Eve night. Problem is, even though dozens of people saw him in Louisiana, there is no proof. Simmons believes he was charged with murder because he was a likely suspect. I ain't gonna lie, you know, I wasn't no good guy in college that happened to stumble on this here. And, you know, I was out there doing the little things, but I wasn't no murderer, wasn't no robber. So for 28 years, Glenn Simmons has been caged by a conviction he can't erase, living in a place where barbed wire paints a shadow on the sidewalk. Well, this is the report. A few years back, he started studying state law, enlisted the most unlikely man to help, the lawyer who sent him to death row. The prosecutor, Mr. Mile, felt, I have no animosity toward him, you know, none at all. He was doing his job, what he thought was the facts. Bob Milfeld wouldn't agree to an on-camera interview, but it's his written word that speaks louder anyway. In these letters, he writes to the parole board, Simmons' case has, quote, troubled him through the years, that the evidence was thin, that the verdict a week later could easily have been different. So far, the letters have been no help. I get the impression they want me to show remorse or take responsibility for the crime. And I'm constantly telling them I can't do that, you know, it's because it's not my crime, I didn't do it. Nearly three decades after conviction, reasonable doubt still runs hot through his veins. No, I've never been hopeless. I have never, never been hopeless on. I've never stopped trying to get out. Maybe, maybe if I was guilty. A few days shy of his 50th birthday, Glenn Simmons knows a different kind of justice. Sure, he wants out, but even more than that, he wants an answer. What happens if the system puts an innocent man away? We wanted to talk to Glenn Simmons' lawyer, the man who was disbarred after the trial. He's passed away, as has the judge in the case. We sought out the case's lead detective, Sergeant Tony Garrett. He actually won an award for solving that murder, but he refused our request for an interview. As of tonight, Glenn Simmons has no pending appeals, no upcoming parole hearing.